Hello everyone, welcome to my next small talk. Um, today I'm going to talk about teaching students at the C1 and C2 levels. Uh, I'll be talking about different advanced methods and I hope you will be um, with me and you will enjoy the presentation. So, when you think about um, teaching students at the advanced levels, you must have noticed, if you have some experience, that over the last let's say two decades, we have uh, witnessed a lot of changes to the way we generally teach English um, and especially um, teach English at higher levels. Um, if you look at, um, at, at the slide, you will see some of the changes. It's a random selection of, of ideas that have uh, come to my mind. What has changed? Let's have a look. First of all, um, a shift from um, accuracy to fluency. The next one, uh, um, from um, looking at errors, at something very, very important to the so-called Mufta Tsochceta movement, uh, um, <laughs> the term I coined, um, from speech acts where students were taught to give speeches to what we um, now say speech events, in which um, students participate in all kinds of exchanges in English, conversations, YouTube videos, they kind of produce English for different purposes. Um, from linguistic competence, very generally understood competence, to more social linguistic competence, which includes things like politeness, for example, uh, context in which you have to produce English and how much of this English you can produce correctly. Uh, from thematic vocabulary, where we used to teach um, hundreds and millions of words connected with one particular theme, to the shades of meaning, for example, to things like collocation, uh, like colligation as well. From the idea of study it all, so they had lists of words which they had to study, to more high frequency words that we focus on and get our learners to study. So from kind of mm, local to more global, from um, looking at mistakes to general successful communication in English. Now some of these trends have been very positive and they have affected the way we teach really well, but some of them I don't think actually work for um, advanced students and to some extent they even hinder their progress. So I want to look critically at what has changed uh, uh, for the better and what has actually changed for the worse and how we as teachers can cope with the situation as it is. All right? I have divided my presentation into four um, segments. Um, all of them will somehow be devoted to one very important aspect of teaching at these two levels. So, um, <laughs> you must um, uh, know that we talk a lot about the so-called intermediate plateau, where students at the intermediate level um, feel very frustrated when it comes to uh, the, their progress and, and often give up. Now, we should also talk about what I call um, the great uh, C1 depression, where students uh, feel even more frustrated because they know they have reached a very high level, but they still feel they're not fluent or accurate enough. And they actually, because of that, feel a lot of disappointment. So how, what can I, as a teacher, do to move them forward um, even more? Um, the, the problem with um, uh, moving on is basically connected with transfer. So they are fed with lots of different structures, fed with lots of different um, expressions and phrases. And the, the trick is how can they transfer this into productive skills? And I think this is what makes our students feel frustrated at this level. The, the, the transfer doesn't happen as quickly as they would wish uh, for it to, to happen. Um, so on average, when you think about C1 students, this is my experience, my own count. Um, they encounter about between 70 and 90 words and expressions per teaching unit. Teaching unit means about, what, two weeks of work, perhaps? So think about how many structures and how many words your students encounter, how many of them they remember, and how many of them they can produce later on and use and feel um, happy that they can produce this kind of um, language. So it's actually a bit frightening that there are so many words and so few actually become remembered and used. Um, when you think about real-life communication, it's not what you know, is it? It's what you remember, because when you produce language, it's, it's what comes to your mind, what you remember, what you can retrieve very easily from your memory. You must um, also understand that students um, are busy, we are all busy, and I, I begin to think that students do not take things into their hands, they need the teacher to lead them um, successfully and they need the teacher who can think for them and make sure that this progress happens um, much quicker. So I believe that their, their success is in my head and in my careful planning of what I do and how I intend to achieve 
um, goals that the students can uh, uh, also achieve with me together. So step one, this is actually a very, very important thing. Um, have a look at these numbers, uh, 1, 10, 30 and 60. Think about what these numbers mean. Um, if you think about how we remember language and how quickly we forget language, these numbers stand for days. Uh, time. So it's one day, 10 days, 30 days and 60 days. If you learn something um, according to this particular theory, which I believe in and I have tried and tested it in my own classroom, uh, if you remind students of the words the next lesson after 10 days, after 30 days, after 60 days, they remember this really, really well. Now, when you teach on average about seven, eight months a year, then th this is like a cycle, so this basically repeats. So the students encounter the same words, the same phrases, the same structures so many more times. The thing is for the teacher to remember to do these revisions um, every uh, 10 days, 30 days and then 60 days and it really works perfectly well at least for my students. Now, um, the, the theory is based on this one very simple sentence. The sentence says that you should be reminded of the word precisely when you are beginning to forget it. And apparently we forget words after 10 days, 30 days and 60 days. It's phenomenal. I believe it, it works for my um, students. Now, this is all based on the idea of um, how easily we can retrieve language. But what is even more important is how stable the language is in our brains. And apparently for the stability to happen, the cycle of 1, 10, 30 and 60 days should be um, carried out. Right, now, um, sort of uh, practical aspects of how this can be uh, achieved here are some ideas that you can use with your students when you want to revise language in this particular type of, of a cycle, the one I have just mentioned. Uh, number one, make lots of different cards um, with words and expressions on them. Keep these cards and whenever your students uh, repeat the task, want to revise the language, bring the cards with you, put them around the classroom, get the students to talk about the same task and use the words again every 10 days, 30 days, 60 days and again, right? The next idea is you can give students um, different speaking tasks, like for example this one, one of my favorite tasks from Global Advanced, where students have to um, look at uh, these um, inventions and decide how um, likely these things are going to uh, remain um, in our language in 30 years' time. So the language the students are going to need is the language of speculation, future structures possibly, maybe some uh, synonyms for become obsolete. It's a possibility. So what I do, I make sure that I remember what the task was, and for each task, I produce a list of um, expressions that the students can use with this particular task. And again, the students repeat the task after 10 days, 30 days, 60 days. The results are amazing because they remember um, the words much better. But what is even more important is that they begin to use them more accurately and they become much more fluent because they have had a chance to repeat um, the language. So this is um, idea number two. Idea number three is that you get your students to record vocabulary um, in their notebooks, for example, or pieces of paper, which they keep in their folders. And then again, regularly, every 10 days, 30 days, 60 days, they test each other using these words. Again, extra reinforcement. And finally, I often um, organize in-class writing tasks, short ones, because students are not very keen on writing, where again, the words I bring, um, I display around the classroom, they are supposed to use in their short piece of writing, uh, again, for more fluency and more accuracy. And again, the cycle repeats. So I do believe in this um, kind of approach. Now, um, when it comes to step number two, which I want to tell you about, it's about um, striking the balance between fluency and accuracy. As I said at the very beginning, um, the shift has been from um, accuracy towards fluency which may be fine if you just want to be communicative in English. But if you want to be a C1 or C2 speaker, just being communicative doesn't do the job. So we need to strike the balance between the two um, aspects of, of teaching and two aspects of knowing a foreign language, basically. So accuracy time. Um, I have two big pieces of cardboard in my classroom. On one, uh, it says accuracy time, and on the other one, it says fluency time. And uh, when I display this to my students saying, look, guys, today it's accuracy time, they know that the speaking task they're going to do, um, they will have to focus on what they say and how they say it. When it comes to fluency time, I show them the, 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 the banner, the poster, and they say, guys, today's fluency time, 
what you can do is just speak freely, don't worry about any mistakes at all. So they have, um, we are very clear about what we do in, in class, and I always communicate this um, methodology to my students so they understand uh, really well why we do what we do. Now, when you think about accuracy, people tend to think um, that accuracy refers more to grammar, whereas we know that students become terribly inaccurate when it comes to the use of vocabulary. So um, have a look at some of these um, scans from Global Advance where you see how vocabulary is being developed. It's being developed in a very modern way, where students look at um, short um, snippets of the language and see how particular items of the language uh, are used and they analyze this really uh, practically and from the communicative point of view. Uh, this is the example of, of, of how we teach the word great, which has so many meanings, but very often students are simply not aware of how this can be used. Another slide will show you, for example, um, uh, how we work with simple words. Small and little may mean the same. However, as we know, they are used differently and students must be aware of those shades of meaning that these words actually have and how they are used. The same goes for all kinds of connotations of words, how words are used and why words are used in certain contexts. Again, Global does it really very well. They have these special extended vocabulary sections where you will find um, a great um, like a treasure trove of ideas of how to develop um, lexical accuracy with your um, students. Um, at the same time, we must remember that uh, students are not quite able, even at C1 and C2 levels, uh, to use the vocabulary that we teach straight away. And very often uh, their inaccuracy comes from the fact that we expect them to produce uh, language too soon. So we teach, off we go, speak, use the language. So in many ways, we uh, get them to uh, produce inaccurate language because it's too fast. Uh, they haven't yet quite grasped the, the sense of, of the word, for example, and definitely not the way it is used. So be aware of this, perhaps give, give less, but more of uh, good quality. Um, so uh, showing to the students this amount of vocabulary, for example, in one lesson, which often happens in class, is basically pointless. Students are not supposed to learn um, so many words uh, in, in, a, in a short uh, piece of time. They have to be given um, words of good quality that are actually processed uh, many times, revised many times, before we expect them to use these words correctly. Now, so teaching accuracy is like drilling for oil. Close is not good enough, basically. You have to concentrate more on what people um, uh, do and how accurately they can use a particular phrase. Right. Some examples of what can be done in class. Have a look at this wonderful, uh, very simple thing. Um, I often give my learners this particular chart and I ask them to um, choose four or five words from the list that they have studied. And I say, okay, guys, write the words in, please, and then give me the definition of the word and how you think the word is used. Um, so they try to do this. They, they assume they know. Very often they do, but sometimes they don't. And then we open the books, open dictionaries, and see how these words are actually used correctly and accurately in English. They keep the list. We use them for revision later on. It's a very good way of making sure students understand the idea of um, accuracy as such. Um, another good idea is mm, called mm, recall insight and question, as you see here. Um, it's, I, I've taken this from my management course, but I think it applies to teaching a language as well. Um, where you ask your students to recall three um, structures of three uh, expressions from each lesson. This usually happens at, at the end of the lesson. And uh, students are supposed to write down what they think the word means. And maybe uh, they have got some questions about the usage of, of how these words um, can be used in English. And they write one question uh, if they don't understand how uh, these particular words are used and perhaps what they exactly mean. And the interesting thing is, at the end of the class, students can work in pairs and help each other answer these questions. If I have no time, I collect these pieces of paper, I take them home, I answer students' questions through email or as part of my uh, next lesson. So it's a good way of, um, at the end of the class, make sure you, know, you understand, you don't understand, let me um, help you here. So. Um, Let's make students um, work um, on more accuracy through an activity called low tech high potato, where you focus on activities um, where students write sentences and prepare short texts. There's a lot of um, reading matter 
in most books, um, and texts are usually interesting at, at this level. So uh, imagine you've read a text in class, students have uh, somehow processed the text, have learned some vocabulary from the text, and they come uh, to you for the next lesson. And you ask them, first of all, to uh, remember the vocabulary as much as possible. And then secondly, you ask them to uh, write sentences which are true of the text using particular words. So for example, student one gets one word. They have to create a sentence with this particular word, which is true of the text that they read the previous class. Then the student passes on this piece of paper, like a hot potato, to another student who has another word, who has to prepare another sentence that is true of the text using this particular word. After this um, finishes, we kind of have a text, which is perhaps not very cohesive, but we have a text where students have tried to use the word they think they remember from the previous class. And they can open the books and compare if these words were used in the similar way, in the similar fashion, as uh, in the course book. It's a good exercise sort of in, in comparing how things um, work, the language, how it works. The same goes for, um, for grammar, really, because we can do exactly the same with grammatical structures. It doesn't have to be just um, mm, vocabulary. But students must be aware of one thing. There isn't anything like painless grammar. Grammar is always painful, but grammar is important because it builds structures, it builds texts. And students must be aware of the fact that studying grammar is important, but it's not as easy as we think. I can do it in a fun way. I can prepare lots of excellent activities, but still studying grammar and making sure you are accurate when it comes to grammar is a very long process. And they have to be um, aware of this. So um, I have a, a couple of exercises for you to have a look at and perhaps practice with your students where you focus on this accuracy. The first one is called developing questions. Um, the way it works is uh, following. You ask the students to make a list of um, question words such as what and which and how and why, etc. And then you ask them to make a list of modal verbs such as should, will, might, may, etc. And then the students have to combine the question word with the modal verb and create a question for their partner. So you, for example, end up uh, with something like, why might? Hmm? And the student uh, has to come up with a question, why might you do something, for example? So it's a good way of focusing on two uh, snippets of grammar, which is the question word and modal verbs um, together. Obviously, students write down the questions because they want to see them. This is the accuracy time, so mistakes um, are important not to overlook. And uh, I keep these questions. They can obviously discuss them, answer the questions. But I keep the questions and then whenever the next revision comes up in 10 days, 30 days, 60 days, uh, the questions come back uh, as well. Another idea, which I like a lot, is called the verb story. Um, you read a story to your learners, a simple story, usually past tenses, conditionals, like a typical story. And you get them to focus not on the meaning of the story yet, or the vocabulary from the story, but you get them to focus on structures from the story and write as many structures as they possibly can. Obviously, once they have written down the structures, you ask them perhaps to reconstruct um, the story, which is possible. Now, what I, this is like a step further here. I often do this. I give the students four structures. Four is not many, four structures that I want them to revise. As you can see, uh, past tenses, um, uh, modal verbs in the past, uh, uh, etc. Um, I ask the students to look at the structures and think of how they can use these structures in a very short story. They can't change anything. They can't change any word. They can change the order of the structures, but this is what they have to produce and write a story. Again, this focuses their mind really well on just four structures I want to revise. So I think it's an excellent idea to, to get the students to focus, concentrate more on accuracy. Okay, uh, you also have to be aware of, um, of, of, of this. It comes from the, the so-called language awareness movement, where people advocate analyzing the language somebody else produces and the language the students produce themselves. And it's actually crucial that we take advantage of this particular trend, which I think is very good. So again, some ideas for you here um, to use to get your students to record sentences with the newly acquired vocabulary, for example, on their mobile phones. What happens when you ask your students to record themselves on their mobile phones? 
they begin to listen to themselves because they know that the teacher is going to listen to these sentences, check these sentences. They might appear uh, on, the, uh, on the website if you have your, your own um, classroom website, for example, which in, in our school we tend to do. And, um, and students, when they record themselves, they kind of make uh, an effort to sound more accurate. So that's a very good thing for the students to do. So there are lots of um, ideas um, that we can use to make sure that the students record their language um, correctly. Okay, so basically accuracy is one of the ideas. Okay, over the um, past years, you, you must have noticed that functional language hasn't been quite taken care of as well as it should have been. Uh, there were short sections on functional English often ignored by the teachers and the students themselves. Um, and now I think we're going back to teaching a lot of functional English, helping students function in different contexts across the world. So it's a very welcome change in global advance where you have two pagefuls of activities which help students um, function in English, um, uh, both fluently and um, accurately. So uh, a very welcome change. Now, step three um, is fluency. So accuracy and fluency. Again, fluency people again associate mainly with speaking, but we also talk ab about fluency when it comes to, to writing. And we mustn't forget this, that students need both fluency and accuracy, both in speaking and writing. Now, when you think about fluency time, if you remember my poster, so fluency time to the students signals the fact that they can just talk, generate ideas, think creatively, and I don't walk around and I don't point out any mistakes to them. They just talk for the sake of talking, practicing um, um, their, their, their language. One of um, the few activities I have prepared for you for today is called um, AI modal, uh, which means that you uh, give students four different roles that they can assume. The first one is the fault finder, the next one is the dictator, the next one is the school teacher, interesting what it might be, and the last one, um, AI thinker. Now, the roles are as follows. Um, the fault finder says the idea is good, but the dictator says no to anything. The school teacher says no, the idea isn't good because, and the AI thinker says yes, and we could also do. I, students have to work in groups of four, and I give them a statement. For example, let's go to the cinema. One of them has to be a fault finder, so he says, uh, the idea is good, but, and says why. The dictator says, no way, I'm not going anywhere to any cinema at all. Uh, the school teacher continues, and the AI thinker continues again. Then the next statement, students change their roles, and again, they lead the conversation in this way. Through this particular model, they can actually practice fluency and what generating ideas is what advanced students also need. So the more they can say, the more they can develop their arguments, their opinions, um, obviously, the better. Another idea is called three, uh, 4 3 two, which you might be aware of, perhaps you've done this many times before in your life, is when students, for example, have to describe um, some kind of an, I don't know, uh, incident from their life or an anecdote or, or a joke or a, or a story. And uh, first of all, they have four minutes to say it to one partner, and they have three minutes to say to another partner, and then they have two minutes to say to yet another partner. Basically what happens is that students begin to speak much faster and therefore develop their accuracy. The same can be transformed when it comes to, to writing, obviously. I'm not saying that students have to say something, write, write something down in four words and three words and two words because it's impossible, but perhaps it would be useful to get them to um, write down a story in four paragraphs, three paragraphs and two paragraphs. So again, they have to compact the language, think about uh, quickly about how to produce different um, ideas. So these things work uh, for me very well. Now, again, going back to global, Encouraging students to write short pieces is actually crucial. Um, long essays sometimes don't work. Students, unless they take exams, have no time. But writing in class short pieces is actually wonderful. This is an idea from the book where students have uh, different beginnings of, of the stories. Uh, here, and they choose one, and they are supposed to continue the story. Now, to make it more interesting for the learner, um, I use what we call story cubes. And I would like to show you the cubes, the way um, they look. You buy them actually, I don't know, online. I, I brought them from England, but you can easily get them on Amazon. And um, they look like this, sort of decent quality um, cubes, dice with different pictures on them. There are nine of them um, in each set. There are different sets, um, um, each pair, because I tend to do this writing in pairs. They are more encouraged and they like it more. Uh, they throw the dice, they end up with nine different pictures, okay? And they have to, um, continue the story using um, 
uh, the ideas from, from the cubes. It's much more creative, students kind of laugh and, 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 and have uh, more fun because of it. So, so it's actually um, very useful. Um, again, writing and, and sharing ideas, making writing interactive is another strength of, of global, uh, where students have to, like in this case, um, describe their favorite um, toy when they were children, exchange the pieces of writing, and each partner writes two questions for, for, for the other person, for the owner of the, of the, of the description. Um, it's much more interactive. So I describe my favorite um, uh, toy. I get two questions from my partner to answer. Uh, writing becomes sort of developed into speaking, basically. But again, what matters is the fluency uh, th that you produce ideas. Accuracy is not important yet. Um, so to finish off, really, I'd like to decide um, on the fourth and actually very crucial element um, of teaching any student, and definitely student at C1 and C2 level, and it's called juice. Does anyone know where it comes from? Perhaps I can think for a while. Uh, I was reading some news, and uh, this term is used by sales representatives who sell uh, different things to, to people. And apparently at the end of each meeting, they just shout, juice, juice. And I was puzzled to find out what it is. And basically, it stands for join us in creating excitement. And that's crucial for, for teaching at any level. So we have become juicers, apparently. And we are supposed to create excitement. But also, don't forget that we are supposed to create education, education of good quality. So join us in creating education. Thank you very much.